Hello and welcome back, I'm Alex and this is the Art of Tinkering. Over the last couple months all parts for the project have arrived and it is finally time to tinker with the machine again. But today we are going to do a nerd session as we will explore how the machine used to work and how the new system gets control over the new and old components like the spittle motor, X and Z motors and the encoders, sensors and the tool changer, the hydraulic system and the cooling system. We plan the computer for Linux CNC and the user interface of the machine. So buckle up and follow me to a deep dive into the documentation. The old controller is based on an old Siemens C-Numeric. In the last videos you saw how I removed the controller and tore down the control cabinet from the machine. So everything is gone by now. The new system will be based on Linux CNC. Linux CNC is a program that gives the functions of the machine a user interface and manages everything. Originally I wanted to use an old Mac Mini and run Linux on it. However, there are problems with drivers for Apple's hardware and for some reason old Mac Minis take a long time to boot Linux. This seems to be a common problem with Mac Minis however. So instead I choose a PC called GK41 by Minis Forum. This PC in my opinion is perfect for Linux CNC because Linux CNC runs very fast on it and all the drivers worked right away. It also has a nice feature that you can turn on via the BIOS, which is that it automatically turns on when it gets power, which makes it easy to include in a control cabinet. It requires 12 volts and 3 ampere to operate. It is also practical that it has two Ethernet ports, so it can be connected to the internet on one port and the other port can be used to connect a MESA card. A MESA card basically provides an interface from the computer to the encoders, sensors, motors, pumps and all other components that the machine consists of. I choose a MESA 7i95 mainly because it was available to buy. It supports up to 6 axes with step deer interface and 6 encoder inputs, 24 inputs and 6 high powered outputs. To get enough pins for my machine I will also need to use a couple of available IOs on the expansion port. Where there used to be a CRT screen and a keyboard, a 22 inch touchscreen now finds a new home. On the screen the user interface of Linux CNC is displayed. We get all possible information displayed there and we can control the machine with it. The user interface is customizable and I plan to use a UI framework called ProBasic. Since buttons are nice, additionally under the screen we will install a couple of buttons to start, pause and stop the machine. Install turnable knobs to adjust the spindle and feed speed and of course an emergency stop. Also we will add two hand wheels, one for the X and one for the Z axis. I hope with this the CNC machine can be operated like a manual machine. So let's take a look at what else we can connect to the MESA card. So that we can look at the documentation together, I have scanned it. First of all, they thank you for buying the machine and there also are some contact data for customer service. Table of contents, well, we will skip that. Technical data, that gives us quite an interesting overview. For example, here it says that the largest workpiece can have a diameter of 15 cm and a length of 35. The spindle motor originally had a power of 11 kW and a speed range of 100 to 4000 RPM. We also see here that the X and Z axis motors ran at a maximum of 3000 RPM and had a rated power of 0.8 kW and 1.6 kW. The height of the machine is given here as 1 m and the weight of 2.5 metric tons. The documentation now continues with the spindle motor. The machine is originally equipped with a DC shunt motor. This drives the spindle via 4 V-belts. For tensioning the belts the motor is mounted on a plate which can be swung down by this screw here. This is a blower to cool down the motor. You can't see the part of the drawing here. On the drawing on the next side you can see the missing part but in a close up. 
Next to the pulley on the motor is a tooth belt which is connected to an encoder. This encoder outputs 1024 pulses per revolution. The controller can receive and evaluate these and thus Linux CNC knows exactly where the spindle is located. This is important to keep the X and Z axis synchronized with the thread when tapping. It will also help us later when we want to position the spindle at a precise location. For example to engrave text in the workpiece. The new motor is a 7.5 kW servo with a peak torque of 48 Nm. There are lots of possibilities to use this thing but I'm mostly interested in the speed and position mode. In position mode we can use the spindle like a fourth axis on a CNC mill. Basically we can use it like an ordinary stepper and just send step gear signals to the driver and it will move the motor accordingly. Not sure how it will turn out but I have lots of ideas I want to try out with this on the machine. In speed mode the motor speed correlates to a given frequency by the MESA card. To switch between modes we use one of the inputs here. Also we connect an enable and emergency stop signal to the driver. The outputs can be programmed to send a fault signal and that we will connect to the MESA card as well. I'm not sure yet if I will get it to work but with Modbus we should be able to read motor current and overall status of the motor and driver and I really hope to get these informations displayed in Linux CNC. On this page you can also see very nicely how the spindle is supported. We have 5 tapered ball bearings here. The manual says that these should be removed, cleaned and re-greased every 6000 hours. And if I get the spindle apart I will try to do that. Next you can see the x-axis drive. Both motors of the axis are disk motors. This means that the coils are like in a disk around the motor axis. This gives the motor a lot of torque. Many people use such motors as generators for do-it-yourself wind turbines for example. I will save the motors. Someday we may be able to build something fun out of them. The ball screw is driven by the motor with a HDD tooth belt. Another encoder is found on the end of the ball screw. We will also keep this one and connect it to the new controller. This will allow us to determine the position behind the belt. The measurement on the ball screw is actually somewhat inaccurate because it can still have some backlash on the ball nuts. A glass scale measuring the position directly on the carriage could determine the position much more accurately. However that could be retrofitted at some point in the future. Currently the encoder on the ball screw will be enough. Next we see the x-axis drive. The tool turret is shown on the left. You can also see the cover that you see from the outside. At the top of the axis is a box containing the motor for the drive. The motor is driven by two belts as with the z-axis. An encoder is installed on the end of the ball screw. On the right side behind the encoder a couple of lines are drawn. These are distributors of oil lines to lubricate the bearings. All ball bearings and linear guides are supplied with lubricating oil from the central lubrication system. Ports for the oil are drawn in many places in the drawings and you can find them everywhere. So let's have a look at the machine. Right now it's opened up so we can have a look at the mechanics. Here I changed the original DC motor with the 750 watt AC servo and also I reinstalled new belts. Here you can see this is the oiling system which lubricates all the ways and all the bearings. And this here is the original encoder which was used to um, get the position for the DC motor. I reinstalled it despite the AC servo actually has its own encoder. But I thought um, there are two belts in between and it doesn't hurt to have this encoder installed. And if it doesn't bring any benefits then I can just disable it in the software. Both motors are from the same manufacturer and can be bought off eBay. The motor for the Z-axis is shown here and I think for this application it is plenty overpowered but I had it already since I bought it as a spindle motor some time ago when I still wanted to CNC my mini lathe. The motors also come with a driver and all about it really screams quality. In this application we need only the position mode and so we will connect step gear and enable signals to it. 
Also, we will connect the fault signal output to the Mesa card so it can detect a crash. This driver can also communicate via Modbus and as with the spindle motor, I hope to get the motor status of both motors displayed in Linux CNC, but I have never done it so we will see how we can figure it out. The motor shaft of the new motors was a little bit smaller than the original ones so a SLA printed adapters that fit perfectly. For some people that looks really sketchy but it's not stupid if it works. Below and on the right side of the axis there is also a switch and this brings us to the next topic. The machine has different kinds of switches and other sensors installed at many points in the machine in order to obtain feedback on the status of the machine. When the machine is switched on it is not known at first where exactly the axes are located since no absolute encoders are installed. Therefore a homing procedure is run at the beginning by slowly moving the axis in one direction until they reach a reference switch. From here the controller can calculate the distance relative to this point and now knows the exact position of the axis. In the Weiler Primo CNC machine this was solved by cam rails. T-slot rails in which small blocks are screwed. There are four grooves and the switch has four pins with which the blocks are recognized. What you see here is a reference switch for each X and Z. In Linux CNC we set up which distance can be driven relative to this point. In case this is programmed incorrectly in the controller or a step error occurs, a over travel switch is additionally installed at both ends of the axis. In case something goes really wrong and the motor still try to move, there is an emergency stop switch which will disconnect the motors from power directly. If we stay with the motors we also find another sensor on the spindle axis. It is triggered at 4 positions on the spindle and therefore at the moment it reads 4 pulses per revolution. For Linux CNC we need a signal that is triggered one time per revolution. Therefore we will have to adapt the setup here a little bit. Also there is this thing here. This is a pump which generates pressure on the lubricant oil for the bearings. So at the back, I think here you can see it, there's the line which distributes later into the different bearings. Here's also a little sensor which is triggered when the tank is empty. And here is a port where the oil can be refilled. More sensors can be found in the tool turret and we will take a look at it now. The tool change system is solved in this machine with a so-called head revolver from the German company Sauter. The structure can be divided into three areas. At the top is a switch room. In this there are four inductive sensors, which report the current position of the turret back to the controller. The tools are mounted below on the rotary head, which can be rotated automatically by the machine. The whole thing is screwed to the machine with the base plate. There are also the connections for the sensors, the hydraulics and the cooling. Also the axis for the cables of the sensors starts there. In the middle these are laid upwards into the switch compartment. You can see two of the switches here as well as a grub screw that triggers one at each position. Between the head part and the base plate is the turret as mentioned. At the top are ports from which coolant can be sprayed. Internally the coolant channel is laid in such a way that liquid only comes out of one port at a time. Below this the tool holder is shown. Various tool holders can be screwed in here. In the middle there is a piston which looks like this. This is moved by hydraulic pressure. The whole thing can be seen in more detail here. We have a port A and port B. These are connected by two hoses to two solenoid valves. S1 and S2 at the hydraulic aggregate. Here below is a table of how the solenoids are switched to use the turret. When S1 is off and S2 is on, the turret is blocked and ready for operation. If S1 is on and S2 is off, the turret will be unlocked and the working piston will move upwards, turning the turret once by 90 degrees. Otherwise it is still described here as an emergency stop when both are off. I think this traps the hydraulic oil in the turret and nothing moves. Here is also a table of the switching times and the expected sensor data. Um, 
Okay, so what we see here is the switching state of the valve at the beginning. First, both are off. Now comes the command to switch. S1 opens and oil is pressed into the turret. The turret rotates so that the sensor B1 indicates that position 1 has been left and this continues until the transport piston has reached the top and sensor B2 indicates that position 2 has been reached. We see that now a short time passes and valve S1 is closed and valve S2 is opened. This causes the transport piston to move back down again and as long as this happens the machine has to wait. The duration is defined with T1. For me this is 0.4 seconds. Well and by repeating this the next position can be approached so actually this is quite simple. Here's the hydraulic unit that is installed in the machine. The whole thing is mounted on a plate and underneath is a tank with hydraulic oil. Here on the left a motor is looking out. It belongs to the hydraulic pump. The oil is pumped into a pressure regulator which can be adjusted here with the wheel. The oil pressure is adjusted for the chuck and is important so that soft materials are not crushed by the chuck. Further to the right we see four valves, two each for the chuck and the turret. Hidden behind the valves is a switch that is switched by temperature. The wheel here is used to set the temperature it triggers. This system turns on an oil cooler on top of the machine. This pumps the oil through a radiator and cools it down. Currently, unfortunately, this is broken. In fact, this was one of the problems why I got the machine sold. After some time in operation, the oil got hot and became thinner. This caused the pressure to drop and the chuck could no longer reliably hold the workpiece. We will take a closer look at the oil cooler in the next video. Otherwise, there is still the return line of the oil here in front. It is pressed through a filter here and then goes back into the tank. There is also a pressure sensor on the oil filter, which is supposed to give feedback if the filter is clogged. I'm not sure what this thing up here is, but I think it's a manual valve to manually open the chuck. Now let's take a last look again at the documentation. We see here the mechanism that opens and closes the chuck. It is driven by hydraulic pressure and attached inside is a long pipe which connects it to the chuck. Inside the chuck then there is a mechanism which opens and closes the jaws or, and we can see this on the lower half too, pull in a collet chuck. The manual mentions that there are some modules that can be attached to this, for example to connect an automatic bar loader to it, but I don't have any of those. So for this we don't have to connect anything else than the two solenoids to the Mesa card. The machine compartment is waterproof and that's pretty cool because it allows for flood cooling. Obviously I don't have footage showing it yet, but as the name implies it simply floods the workpiece with a jet of coolant to cool and lubricate it. Below the machining area is a hole under which a trolley is positioned. This catches all chips and also the cooling fluid. The fluid can drain through this mesh here and is collected in the trolley underneath. This also has a function to collect oil before the fluid is pumped back out again into the machine. I have not yet cleaned this thing and instead I use it to store all the stuff that is still greasy. A detail I found interesting is found on the spindle. When a workpiece is flushed with cooling, some can enter the spindle bore and exit on the other side and to prevent it from leaving the machine there is a funnel which collects it and feeds it back in the machining area. To get the cooling to work we only have have to switch the water pump. I also consider adding an connector for pressurized air, so we also get the option for a sort of mist cooling. That should be it for today. Of course there is a lot more information in the manual. Like for example we didn't cover the optional manual or hydraulic tailstock for this machine, but my machine doesn't have it so why bother? We will begin fixing the hydraulic cooler next and then rebuild the control cabinet. I have no clue how to set up Linux CNC and connecting Modbus devices to it, but I look forward to find it out with you guys as we go. Thank you for joining me on this adventure. I enjoyed it and I hope to see you soon. Until then, have a nice day.
Tschüss.